Thank you, Camila. So tell me about yourself. My name is James Roy. I'm a neurotherapist, originally from Vancouver Island, Canada, um, but currently living here in the UK. Um, my wife and I started up a company three years ago in 2007 um, called Symphonic Mind, and we do neurotherapy. We now have clinics in Bristol, Brighton, and London. So what is neurofeedback? Neurofeedback. Neurofeedback is feeding back the, the, the brain states. So very much like the old style biofeedback. Um, so biofeedback would, an example of biofeedback would be heart rate. So you can learn to control your heart rate if you see a heart rate monitor, right? That's, that's biofeedback. Um, blood pressure works the same way. We're using neurofeedback, which is learning, con learning to control your internal brainwave states. So it's very crucial for peak performance, emotional regulation, um, functional regulation as well, pretty much anything to do with the central nervous system. And so how did neurofeedback come about? Neurofeedback. It's been around since the 1960s. Um, it was actually NASA that, that started it out. They had, a, they had trouble because astronauts in contact with rocket fuel were getting seizures and they couldn't risk having seizures in astronauts. So NASA at that time in the, in the late 60s, having all the money in the world, um, they started to pioneer in you know, feedback techniques and teaching the brains of these astronauts how not to fit in contact with rocket fuel. So very interesting research, and it became a medical technique for epilepsy at that point in time. Through the 1970s, science really started to get interested in this, and it's and it seemed that it was um, a remedy for an awful lot of cases. Now, the difficult part came in when the spiritual crowd figured out that this was the way to move ahead spiritually. And what happened in the meetings is you've got one third of the room in white coats, two thirds of the room in orange robes, and the whole thing became a bit of a laughing stock. The two just could not get along. And in the scientific community, really it became almost career suicide to get into neurofeedback. So that was, that was through the 70s. In the 80s, a few people stuck with it. Um, a lot of work done in ADD work, attention deficit disorder, and an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And actually, these days, it's now an evidence-based protocol for those. For those. Um, 90s, it started to get into post-traumatic stress, and they started to see that pretty much it was, it was restoring regulation to all sorts of central nervous system-based disorders. So around 2002, 2004, you could get an affordable computer that could keep up to brain speed with very good sensors. And again, those started to come into the affordability range. Amplifiers improved, the whole technology improved. At the same time, we started to have a whole different view as to how our brain worked. And things like neuroplasticity, you know, the brain's ability to change itself. These things were ridiculed um, even in the 90s. And these things began, began to become mainstream. Neuroplasticity, pattern recognition, um, other techniques that work on the same sort of principles in that if you give the brain information that it can make sense of, it will do it. Um, retinal implants for the blind, cochlear implants for the deaf, all of these new things are coming out. And they're working on, this, on very similar principles to neurofeedback. So acceptance is, uh, has really come along and that's done a lot for neurofeedback. Brain mapping has gotten excellent. Um, the whole field of cognitive neuroscience has, has come forward, and the amount that we can do with the brain now compared to 10 years ago is absolutely phenomenal. And so, how did you get into this? How did I get into this? I, I, I got interested in brains really early. Um, I remember I was about five years old, and now, I was changed from a left-hander to a right-hander. And there are certain things that go along with that. And I think I had all of the symptoms. I had the stuttering. I had dyslexia. I had dyscalculia. And I knew at the time that something functional inside me was, was haywire, that something had suddenly gone wrong. And, you know, the diagnosis from the school and, and, and so on was all, oh, you know, dyslexic and not bright and, and all these sorts of things. And I knew that wasn't it. I knew 
from my thoughts internally that something, that it, that it just wasn't flowing right. So, you know, I think my interest in the brain started there. And it started right the way through. I, you know, I was into hypnosis at 12. And all the way through these times, I, I, adults couldn't give me any information whatsoever. I'd ask questions, and it just seemed that anything to do with the brain was something that you just couldn't talk about. Um, and spiritual experience as well. You know, when spiritual experiences started to come, started to come forward for me, I, one couldn't discuss these things. So I, uh, I went through my, my 20s reading everything that I could on, uh, read through psychology, read through neuroscience, and all of these things, it seemed that the Western science was simply denying the fact that they existed. And that wasn't good enough for me. That's not a scientific approach, in, in, in my view. So in, 2000, or in, in 1997, sorry, I went, I decided I'd go abroad for a couple of years. I thought, well, you know, the Buddhists, they've been at this for, they had, a, they had a third of their population, the Tibetans in particular, they had a third of their population working on this for about a thousand years. They, they've got to know something. You know, the Hindus have been at it for, for 5,000 years. They've got to have some techniques. And certainly village healers and, and, and wisdom that's, comes, that's come forward. You know, as a species, we know something about our brains. So my goal was to, was to find out what. And that, that two years away actually turned into 10 years. Um, I spent a lot of time in monasteries. Um, I had ordained for a while. Um, certainly the Hindu tra traditions, I got very deeply into that. And the Hindu tra traditions are great for moving forward mentally because it never actually solidified into a real religion. It's a, bunch of, it's a bunch of branches and sects. So there was never, so dogma never really got to set in. And what the Hindus developed was really a very precise, high-tech set of techniques for moving forward, uh, for moving forward in your, for moving forward in your life, for moving ahead spiritually. Um, through like meditation? Well, through, th through meditation, for, for balancing the mind, and for, and, and for increasing flexibility wi within your mind. Hatha yoga, for doing very much the same thing within your body, because really this is, this is all, all one system. Um, breath exercises, pranayama, you know, there, there's a lot of Western, uh, reading, rebirthing, for instance, is, is, is a form of the same sort of technology. Uh, holotropic breath. All of these sorts of things are, are things that have carried on from that in the West. We, we like to think we invented them, but, uh, but really they've been around for thousands of years. And th really the core thing that all of the Eastern spiritual techniques do is all, very, is all very similar. What they're doing, certainly in the preliminaries, is they're balancing out the central nervous system. Whether you call it in the Buddhist tradition balancing the winds, in the Hindu tradition the, all of the preliminaries are balancing it and pingala nadis. And actually the function of it and pingala nadis, or the winds, or the yin-yang, is identical to the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous systems. So when I came across neurotherapy and had a look at what they were doing, I caught on to it right away. In balancing the parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic, or your rest and digest, fight and flight functions, it's synonymous with clearing trauma. And neurotherapy with new equipment takes this forward so quickly and so rapid. I, I got more of a shift in five days using, using an intensive program on, on neurotherapy than I did in 10 years away. It was certainly a more core shift. And that's when I decided that really I was doing the wrong thing for a living and uh, it was time to switch over. So th this is like a marriage between science and spirituality. Very much so. Yes, you know, with w with modern equipment, we can we we can track um, very specifically the, the the activation patterns, not just between the sympathetic and parasympathetic, but getting into things like ego identity, decision making capability, um, even e even the older style things like attention deficit disorder. If you like, I can show you. A, I, I can show you a bit on the screen. Would you just mind uh, firing this up? So, what can I see on the screen there? Well, ignoring all the right-hand side, what we're looking at here is the right side and the left side. 
of the, of the brain. And actually, we're taking a reading just over the years here. So very much what we're looking at here is the activation of sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now, this person is eyes closed and at rest. And what we want to see is that the person is actually in a resting state. Now, I'm just going to go over the brain waves a little bit here so that you've got a bit of an idea of what I'm talking about. Way down the very low bit here, this is the deep subconscious. So delta is, is what it's called in, in medicine. And this, it's developing between womb and two or three years old. So if you think of a baby in, that, in those times, that's what later in life becomes the deep unconscious. And that's what we're looking at here. So it's most active during dreamless sleep in an adult. This is delta waves, is it? This is, the, the, this is delta waves. And actually, all of these waves are, are the neurons communicating to each other. And they do so at different frequencies. Now, all of the frequencies are running all of the time. But it's a matter of which one is dominant at any particular time is how you're feeling. So if you've been out on, if you've been out on the binge the night before, then you're going to be very high in delta waves, and you can certainly feel that within your body. You're, you're slow and you're sluggish. Chronic fatigue is a, is, is a very good example of that, um, excessive delta waves. Um, if, you are, if you are particularly dreamy and you can't stay on task, well, then you're going to be very high in theta, which is the next, which is the next band up. And actually, that's, that's developing. This becomes the subconscious rather than the, um, rather than the unconscious, and that's usually developing between three and seven. I mean, it's a bit different for everybody, but that's, that's typically when it's developing. Um, and again, later in life, that becomes the subconscious. So this is where creativity, memories, um, fear, where, where, all of these, where all of these sorts of things reside. So that's, that's this next band up right here. And then once we get a little bit further up, you can see there's a, there's a bit of a band there on both, on both sides. And what that is is alpha. And alpha, there's been a lot of work done around alpha because it tends to be the dominant frequency. Monks, for instance, are always higher in alpha than anything else, whether they're on task or not. And alpha is all about being present, power of now. That's all about alpha training. Preliminary meditations, they're all about getting you present and here. And that's, that's alpha. Um, having good, strong alpha is particularly important. And it acts as a bit of an energy reservoir for us as well. So if we need to go into activation, then we take that energy reservoir out of alpha and it, and it starts to go into activation. When we, start, when we want to remember, we want to be able to take that reservoir out and put it into, put it into memory. So that's, that's alpha. Once we start moving forward, sensory motor response band, which is more mind-body communication, and then we start getting up into the betas. So anything that feels like in your body is going to be high frequency activity. Anything that feels slow and sluggish is going to be low. So high frequency activity, you can think of it as fight flight states, post-traumatic stress, curiosity, high interest. All of these things are, are higher frequency. And the, the further you go up the frequency band, the smarter it gets. And actually above beta, you start to get into gamma and later into lambda. And these are actually non-synaptic waves. They're actually quite interesting. Gamma was thought to be spare brain noise, some sort of binding frequency, because gamma is the one that disappears under anesthesia. All of the rest are still there. So if we are anywhere, we're in, we live in gamma. Yeah? Interesting. So it was thought to be spare brain noise until they did um, some studies on some, some of the Dalai Lama's monks. The Dalai Lama is very into the, these sorts of technologies. Uh, he, he dedicates two weeks every two years to this and meeting with top neuroscientists. And I'm getting off topic here, but he's a clever fellow. He started this out in uh, 1989, uh, something called the Mind and Life Institute, which he, which he set up with a couple of neuroscientists. And um, Mind and Life Institute meetings was sort of a meeting between spirituality and science. And it was, it was ridiculed. And actually, there was an outrage within the California scientific community that that these meetings were going on. But the Dalai Lama just sort of said, well, I just want to learn about neuroscience. You know, he's a, he, he loves science. He, he used to take, a, take apart Western tools as kids, and he's always been into science. And he wanted to know what Western science had to say. So it got going that way. And by about two